As we continue this uh, story of Nehemiah, we come now to perhaps one of the greatest challenges to the rebuilding of the, uh, the wall around Jerusalem. Uh, we started with a city that was broken, uh, exposed, poor and embarrassment to the, the people of God, a source of great shame for them. And then this great man, Nehemiah, arrives uh, and he, he's God's appointed man for this season, for this time. And he brings God's people together uh, and uh, uh, um, in, enthuses them and envisions them afresh that the work on the wall can be done, it can be completed. And so Jerusalem can once again be a place of safety, a place of prosperity. And so this great project is, is begun with great faith and hope and great enthusiasm with so, so many people working together to bring it to fruition. And last week we heard about the challenge then of opposition to the building of the wall from the nations around Jerusalem. Those that did not want to see this beautiful stronghold established once again, this city that was at the heart of the identity of the people of God. We saw how this opposition then was successfully overcome and the work on the wall continued. But in the next chapter, we come to, across an even greater potential impediment to the, uh, the completion of this building project. Conflict from within and amongst the community in Jerusalem. Conflict within the city itself. The chapter begins with people bringing a petition to Nehemiah, who we discover for the first time in this uh, chapter has actually been appointed as the governor of uh, the land of Judah. And it seems that the complaints and petitions all come at once, like, uh, uh, you know, everything suddenly uh, sort of going wrong uh, for Nehemiah. Um, and it, 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 it was clear that this had all been growing and growing, the, the unrest uh, and uh, the, the complaints of the people have been growing and growing like some awful boil, um, getting bigger and bigger till finally it burst and all the misery and the pain and the suffering uh, and the frustration of the people is expressed. And there are four issues that are raised by the men and their wives. This is something that didn't just sort of affect a, a disgruntled few, but affected many, many of the families, most of the community within the city uh, uh, of, that, um, of Jerusalem. Now, sacrifices had been made by these families. Uh, Nehemiah had called them to commit to building this wall. This was their top priority until the job was finished. This meant that they couldn't work on the land, they couldn't uh, tend to their livestock, they couldn't ply their trade, whatever it was, to earn their money. Uh, for, to some extent, all of these things had to be put on hold until the work on the wall was finished. And so it affected their livelihoods, their incomes. But the situation was made worse by the fact that the, there'd been a famine in those parts in that, uh, at that time. The harvest had been very, very poor. And this meant that not only was there not so much grain for food uh, to eat, but there wasn't sufficient grain to plant for next year's crop. So for any farmers uh, um, relying on the land for their income, this was potentially a, a financial disaster. But of course for the rich, for those with storehouses full of grain, those with wealth to lend, this was an opportunity. An opportunity to make money, to take land, even to bolster their... their um, uh, their labour supply by taking slaves from among their own people. The first complaint then comes in verse 2. Some were saying, we and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. And then in verse 3, others are saying, we are mortgaging our fields and our vineyards and our homes to get grain during the famine. There were families that, uh, uh, of farms that had borrowed heavily against their property and risked losing it all. If the harvest next year was just as bad, uh, then it would be a disaster for them. They were vulnerable. They felt helpless. Then in verse 4, we read of those who were saying, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's tax on our fields and vineyards. It seems this tax wasn't related to the, uh, the money you made or the crops that you harvested, uh, but more likely raised against the area of land that you owned. So if the harvest was poor, the tax still had to be paid. And finally, in verse 5, the worst, the worst thing of all, we read this. Although we are of the same flesh and blood as our fellow Jews, and though our children are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. Some of our daughters have already been enslaved, but we are powerless because our fields and our vineyards 
belong to others. Ultimately, the only way to pay off a debt in those times, uh, once you'd run out of money and you'd pledged all of your possessions and your property, was to begin to hand over your children to slavery. And this position was being made worse by the fact that they had to commit themselves to build the wall. So what is Nehemiah's response to this? Read in verse 6, When I heard their outcry and these charges, I was very angry. It seems this came as something of a shock to Nehemiah. He knew nothing of the, of the suffering and the loss of his people, what they were going through. Of course he knew about the famine, he knew sacrifices had to be made to rebuild the wall, but he didn't realise what was going on that was making the suffering of the many uh, so much worse because the few were taking advantage of their dire circumstances. This was an abomination as far as Nehemiah was concerned. This was against all the, the principles of mercy and justice upon which their society, their nation, was meant to be built. This kind of behaviour had been the, the kind of thing that had resulted them from being evicted from the land in the first place. Uh, to find it happening again in this, in this city was just so awful. Nehemiah was very angry. How could this be happening amongst God's people? And so what did he do when he heard these accusations? Did he knock heads together? Did he shout and rant and rage and did he bang the table? No. In verse 7 we read this, I pondered them, these accusations, in my mind. The thing was that there was an overriding uh, kind of principle that had got hold of Nehemiah's life in his relationship with the living God. And it's referred to a couple of times in this chapter. In verse 9, he challenged those taking advantage of the people, shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God? Then in the second part of this chapter, where Nehemiah is, is talking about how he, he didn't sort of lay a heavy burden on the people, the reason was out of reverence for God. And in both these places, the word for fear and reverence are the same word, which gives this, this great sense of fear, awe, great respect and reverence for the living God. Nehemiah was angry. He was very, very angry. And his was a righteous anger. He may have even felt God's anger in, in this great injustice. He knew that this mattered to God. But he also knew in his relationship with the living God that if something matters to God, then it matters how he handles it, that he matters that, that he handles it in a way that honours the God that he serves. If he was going to call on God's name and God's ways in addressing uh, this injustice or, the, or an issue, then it matters that he did so in a way that honoured the God whose name he is using. And so he ponders the issue. And maybe a surprising thought comes to him as he ponders. Maybe, maybe he's a little part of this problem. What a thought. Has he in some small or large way contributed to the crisis uh, that has emerged, that's been created? We read later in this uh, passage in verse 10, I and my brothers and my, my own men are also lending the people money and grain. Nehemiah was a man of considerable wealth. He had a very high position in the court of King Artaxerxes, uh, an important and trusted position that he'd have been well rewarded in. We say later in the passage that he was funding the the um, uh, the feeding uh, and the and the, the the feeding and watering uh, of many many people, many important people, out of his own pocket, out of his own resources, and not laying this this burden upon the people. He had a staff. He had a big budget. Um, so he had been one of those lending uh, to the people and presumably looking for some sort of uh, of security for his loans. It might have been handled by uh, other people on his behalf, but nevertheless, it was his money uh, that was being lent. It was his responsibility. So what does he do next? He, he confronts those taking advantage of the people. He challenges them in a number of ways, but I think the most important way, again, is this, this thing in, uh, in verse 9. What you're doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of our God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies. The children of Israel were called to live differently to the nations around them. They were called to be a light to the Gentiles. They were supposed to be demonstrating a different way of living. 
When I read this passage, I wondered how, I sort of thought how unfortunate it was that there was a famine just at the time when the, the, the people of, uh, uh, of the city needed all their strength and all their resources. They could have done with money in the bank uh, for this project. So why would God allow such a thing at that time? And I wondered if maybe he allowed it to highlight a deeper problem than just broken down walls and burned gates. This was, after all, never just about the rebuilding of a city. It was about the rebuilding of a nation, healing a people, bringing the living God back to the heart of the nation of Israel. His ways, his word, his true worship. Nehemiah eloquently expresses his displeasure with those who have been making profit from the suffering of the people. And amazingly and wonderfully, there is repentance, there is worship of this great God. It's as if they, yeah, God, you know, <laughs> this is something wrong against God. And, and the joy there was actually then in, in repenting uh, and, and in turning back to God. Justice is restored. Unity of purpose, once again, to restore this great city uh, was, um, was brought back. And the work of building the wall continued. And so the question is, again, what can we learn from Nehemiah's handling of this difficult situation? The big lesson for me is, is just how important the respect, the reverence, the fear of the Lord is in the work of God. Nehemiah was sent to Jerusalem with the authority of King Artaxerxes, great, a great and powerful king, not a king you messed with, not a king you, uh, uh, you took for granted. But the reality was that Nehemiah was sent there as God's man called to a special work in God's holy city uh, with his chosen people. In a sense, he was called. What he, where he was was like holy ground. Nehemiah had a huge amount of respect, clearly, for King Artaxerxes, but that was nothing compared to the respect and awe and reverence in which he held the living God. We looked at that lovely verse last week in chapter 4 uh, that we kind of made a memory verse in verse 14. Don't be afraid. Remember the Lord, great and awesome. The great thing about Nehemiah was that he didn't just remember the Lord uh, as a comfort, if you like, this great and awesome God when he faced his enemies, but he remembered the Lord in the choices that he made as well. When he had to choose how to deal with the challenge uh, in um, uh, the relationships in, in the city of Jerusalem, when he had to choose how he should live, what he, sh you know, what he should uh, be taking from the people uh, to fund uh, his position there. It was the fear of the Lord, his reverence for God that informed his decisions, informed his choices. The Bible tells us a number of times, such as in Psalm 111 verse 10 and Proverbs 9 verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Nehemiah demonstrates this wonderful wisdom flowing from the fear of the Lord in this passage, in the way he deals with the situation and in the way he chooses not to be a burden to the people in his role as governor. There's a saying that it isn't in the Bible, but I think it's wise and it's true. Fools rush in where angels fear to tread. And so Nehemiah didn't rush in. As he pondered, he recognised that he too was potentially part of the problem. He was honest about his fallibility. And we too, I believe, need to be honest about our flaws and our weaknesses uh, and our fallibility. I've learned over the years that when I feel very strongly about something, when something's really bugging me, especially to do with God's work and God's church and God's people, uh, you know, and I, it may be that I feel that uh, there's a certain amount of uh, justification, a godly justification to my frustration or my anger. Uh, but I've learned over the years to, to go so, so very carefully. And in a sense, the stronger the feeling, the more careful, the more cautious I must be. And three questions that uh, uh, I suggest that um, I need to ask myself in such situations and would encourage you to ask yourselves too. The first one is this. Does this matter to God as much as it matters to me? Is it really my ego uh, that's been uh, affected, that's been challenged in this situation? Is it my need to be right uh, that's actually the, the real issue here? Secondly, to what extent could I be part of the problem 
And I think this was what, what, what Nehemiah sort of came to as he pondered before he expressed all that anger. Is there some confessing that I actually need to do? Is there some sharing of responsibility for the issue that I feel so strongly about? Do I have things that I too need to put right? And thirdly, is it actually my place to act, to seek to put the situation right, whatever it is, um, or is this something I need to pray about? Is this something that actually needs a bit of time for God to sort out? Because he always, always sorts things out better than, than uh, if I rush in uh, to sort it out. His ways are always so much better than mine. And sometimes stopping and praying uh, and um, going to God uh, always first in these challenges is absolutely the best thing to do. We're called to a yet more precious work than building a wall around a city. We are called to this incredible work of building uh, God's great church. We're a people called together in this work, called to love one another, called to live differently to the world, to be a light to the, uh, the people that don't know Jesus. We're called to be a people of forgiveness, of grace and mercy, upon whom these things have been lavished by God. And so in turn, God calls us to be generous with these things ourselves. I really want things to matter to me because they matter to Jesus. But like Nehemiah, I want these things, I want to express these things that matter in a way that pleases and glorifies and honours Jesus with humility and under the fear of the Lord. It's great, isn't it? It is good to know uh, the comfort of this great and awesome and mighty God that we serve. You know, in those times of challenge, to know that God, this great God, is with us. But I would encourage you, uh, not just in the time of challenge, but in the time of choice, to recognise again this great and awesome God that we serve uh, and to choose with a wisdom that comes from the fear of the Lord. Amen.